I'm hoping that non-Indigenous people are seeing this and not only registering it as being funny, but registering it just how sharp and smart it is. And I'm hoping it's priming them to be more receptive and thoughtful about looking at things from Indigenous perspectives. Over the last 30 years, there's been a huge explosion and an exponential growth in Indigenous media and Indigenous media makers here in Canada especially. And actually, we have one of the largest repositories of Indigenous media in the world. TV shows, films, documentaries, even reality TV. But it's not been an easy road to get there. And that's because all of these filmmakers, producers, Indigenous artists have had to navigate this really difficult, challenging, sometimes unfriendly, pretty complex terrain of Canadian media systems and Canadian production companies. What we've seen is in the last 30 years, a lot of Indigenous media makers have made these incredible complex negotiations with these media organizations, and they've helped make space for a whole new generation of Indigenous media makers. And uh, these media makers are now making stories and documentaries and films on their own terms and really telling their own stories. Instead of being told what to do, how to do it, how to say it, these Indigenous creators are making really powerful products. But they are taking control over how their stories get told. And they've even had a chance to subvert some really old colonial stereotypes. So here with me today is someone who is I was going to say obsessed with, but who was an expert on and also obsessed with Indigenous media and in the Indigenous media world, it's Carmen Cray. Carmen Cray is Stolo from Chiam First Nation. She is an associate professor at the School of Communication at Simon Fraser in Burnaby, here in British Columbia. And her research focuses on Indigenously produced and created media in Canada and also the media institutions and the Indigenous people that have had to navigate those institutions to produce their work. She's also the author of Producing Sovereignty, The Rise of Indigenous Media in Canada. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. (laughs) And also, just in case you missed it, we're here in Vancouver. We're at the Iron Dog Bookstore. And we've also got an amazing live audience with us this evening, many of whom are participating in the Amplify Podcast School at Simon Fraser University. So welcome to the audience, too. (laughs) So, Carmen, I just want to start with the ending of your book, if I may. At the very end, you mentioned in the afterword, you talk about a television series, and that is Rutherford Falls. And thank you, by the way, for introducing me to Rutherford Falls because I loved it. I kind of binge watched it in the last like two weeks. I, it's a really fantastic comedy series. It premiered April 2021. And the main character of the show starts off like she's rehearsing this speech that she wants to give. And she starts off with this line, indigenous history is the greatest story never told. For those people who don't know the show, I'm wondering if you can set the set that scene up a little bit or can you maybe just set the show up a little bit? I can a little bit <laughs> and I'll try to avoid too many details. It was a, a program that aired on Peacock. Um, it has two seasons. It was the creation largely helmed by Sierra Teller Ornelas, who's a Navajo um, showrunner. She's one of the co-creators along with, I want to say Mike Schur, creator of The Office, if I'm remembering that correctly, and Ed Helms, who we all remember as Andy in The Office. So it really was a collaborative kind of project. It takes place in the fictional Rutherford Falls, which is located on the traditional territory of the fictional tribe, the Minnishanka. And the protagonist, Regan, is she's a person at the crossroads trying to reintegrate or work closer with her home community, as well as she's the best friend 
of Nathan Rutherford, the descendant of the founder of Rutherford Falls, who is extremely proud of his almost Mayflower-esque heritage. Yeah. And <laughs> she's having to navigate the geographic political reality of in being in a town that is on a um, stolen Minashanka land while also having this really this orientation toward helping her community being a part of it de helping develop a cultural center in the tribal casino to really start foregrounding and making visible the Minashanka history. She's just come back from doing like a degree in museum studies or something like that. Yeah, North at, North, at Northwestern. Yeah. Yeah. So um, she's got a master's degree. She's got kind of a... So close to Ivy that you can taste it. <laughs> it's not... <laughs> she's very much, I think, a product of a lot of what indigenous youth experience right now which is moving around a lot but also being very much drawn to going home yeah. and finding a way to be yourself while doing something for your community at the same time and that takes a lot of work and there's a lot of pitfalls in the process and stumbling blocks and she kind of feels her way through that through the show ed helms of course plays nathan and he's pretty flawless in the bumbling kind of <laughs> puffed up white guy role yeah. he's he's pretty perfect and does a great job so the whole and the whole thing about the statue of him right it's like there's a statue of him in the town and and they she, he wants to keep the statue and this, this becomes this controversy right it's a, this beautiful metaphor his ancestors statue is located at the intersection of the main streets and everybody keeps <laughs> driving into it and crashing their cars <laughs> So the town wants to move the statue and Nathan, of course, is outraged. He yeah. sees that as a, a kind of desecration. And Regan, meanwhile, is kind of standing by his shoulder like, yeah, it is a desecration <laughs> when people move your ancestors off of their territory, you know, yeah. trying to coach him along and he's oblivious. And so, yeah, so lots of built in wonderful narrative tension there. Beautiful show, right? Really great. So what, what, what was so important about that show for you? I think because in a, in a sense, Regan is not a kind an indigenous woman who resolves into a particular type yeah. that is recognizable, say, in film history terms, which is often very much people are oriented towards a more Pocahontas image. It gets called the kind of there's a dualism that's been theorized and talked by Raina Green, for instance, the um, kind of Pocahontas squaw dualism. Mm -hmm that indigenous women tend to get grafted onto. Mm -hmm. So as either that's pure, virtuous, spiritual woman or the degraded, more sexualized, savage woman figure, quote unquote, of So course. she really breaks all of those stereotypes as a character. Yeah, yeah, I think she defies them in terms of her physicality, in terms of her humor, her delivery. She's Jenna Schmieding is a stand-up comedian, and I think you oh, really yeah, get that yeah. through her performance. She's so funny. Her timing. So good, yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. And, yeah. and she's very much wears contemporary indigenous like beadwork clothing so there's a, a kind of visibility if you recognize the beading industry on instagram for instance yeah. you start to recognize those artists uh, oh, that they are actually oh, inserting into yeah. the show okay which is also fun so you talked about the stereotypes like the sort of archetypes that have been there for indigenous women how different is that from what you experienced growing up? I often tell this story that yeah. it took me until I got to university yeah. to encounter Indigenous film at all. I did my first undergrad degree at Simon Fraser University. I was in my, I think I was just 20 at the time, and could not believe that in one of my classes, the teacher showed us Alanisa Bomsawin's Ghana Satagi, 270 Years of Resistance, which is this world famous documentary about the Oka crisis. And I left that classroom being just stunned that there was such thing as oh. indigenous film. 
up until that point, I'm dating myself, this is 25 years ago, but <laughs> to that point, I had never, it had never crossed my mind that this existed because I had never seen it on anything I was watching, which was at that time before the internet <laughs> was going to be broadcast television or the CBC. When I mention what I do, like examining, researching Indigenous media, yeah. now from younger people, I'm getting more of a response of like, oh, reservation dogs. Like they know it, right. so they've seen it, yeah. and they know to reference it. So there's a lot to be said there about the transition of media ecosystems to streamers and their impact on what's accessible yeah. to us, yeah. but also that they're, the fact that Rutherford Falls Reservation Dogs even exist is something I wouldn't have really imagined back when I was coming up. So how did that impact you when you saw it? It triggered a memory. Like when I was a teen, the Oka crisis, we weren't really aware out West, okay. aware of it to the extent that I think people living further East would have been. Mm -hmm. I remember it kind of being something that was probably an elliptical presence in my household, but we didn't like talk about as a family. So seeing that and actually having a fuller understanding of not just what it was, but of the Mohawk perspective of the crisis, of what that was like within the community, yeah. pushing back against thousands of Canadian military was mind blowing. Because I mean, on the one hand, I think I was innocent in a way, like kind of naive of like, the Canadian government deployed the Canadian military against its own people, quote unquote, yeah. like astonishing. Yeah. And but realizing like, no, this is indigenous <laughs> people yeah. that this is happening yeah. to. Yeah. And that, you know, me being a teenager, that this this can happen. This is happening. Yeah. Um, and when I was in my 20s seeing the film, like, oh, my God, this is what the stakes are. Right. The you stakes know, are life and death, actually. Really. Yeah. And like, this yeah. is what the relationship between Canada and Indigenous people looks like. This is what it looks like now. Like, this is not so far out of, you know, I was probably no. just over a decade out of that yeah. conflict. It's not in, 100 years ago. It's not. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like a few years ago. I mean, <laughs> 1990. Yeah. It was like, yeah, it was it was yeah. happening mm -hmm. and a full on armed conflict of astonishing yeah. imbalance. Yeah. That that was amazing portrayal of women too in that in yes. documentary. Beautiful. Yeah, and yeah. it was I think that's a really important detail that Abomsawin insists on leading that film with Mohawk women's yes. interviews yeah. because that's how it would have been done. A Mohawk people would have engaged, it's like the women go out first. So she kind of structured the film to resonate or echo the political structure. That's amazing. Yeah. That's beautiful. So, okay, the Oka crisis more than 34 years ago. <laughs> now, just thinking about your book, too, and your work, can you tell us what's changed in the, in the <laughs> what's changed in the media landscape from 34 years ago? Well, small question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the, the relationship between the state and indigenous people has, of course, evolved after the Oka crisis. There was the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples which the government set out to investigate the relationship between Indigenous people and Canada. Like, you need to investigate it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> let's spend another, like, five years and millions of dollars yeah. telling us what we already know. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of documenting from Indigenous people what the main issues were in thousands of pages of documents, it did provide directions and identified the media specifically as a problem because of how... And this is in, in no small part due to how the Mohawk warriors were being represented by the mainstream media yeah. during the Oka crisis. Like news media, basically. Yeah, news because media. Was, yeah. So yeah. there were directions being given. There was the Oka crisis certainly had in, I don't want to make it sole and only kind of political conflict that triggered mm -hmm. this kind of shift in the media landscape, but it was kind of a culmination and a part of a number of political actions that were happening through the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, mm -hmm. demanding that Canada 
own up to its obligations to indigenous people and it agreed to it in our constitution section 35 82 in 82 yeah so it had to repair its image and part of the way that it did so was to it's like yes let's improve this relationship and let's start allocating federal resources to supporting indigenous representation in many different areas around the country but the cultural arts and cultural sphere in particular was one area that saw allocations of funding and the formation of programs and resources designed to support indigenous artists and creatives so this is where we see it these federally funded or supported institutions but also things like galleries and museums start to reflect on their own programming their own identities and question the extent to which they reflect indigenous yeah. peoples so we start to see indigenous people engaging with these institutions with these programs accessing these services to create space for their perspectives. So you're and talking work. about services like NFB and things like that? Is that the era that we saw like APTN and things like that starting to come up? Yes. Studio One at the NFB gets founded. It's the okay, Aboriginal okay. Film Unit. So that's specifically for Aboriginal or Indigenous documentary film. So that comes out of the 90s. APTN comes a bit later, but yeah. setting up a national Indigenous broadcaster takes a while. So for 30 years, there had been discussions about a national broadcaster, and that eventually happened in 1999. So it was absolutely a part of that era. It just took, you know, right. a while okay. to work out the kinks there. But in your book, you talk about how Indigenous media makers approach how media is made and how they approach it differently from, say, you know, a, a tr Canadian, Western kind of approach. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? So I'm going to try to talk about this through a more recent framework it was yeah. given through the Indigenous Screen Office, which we have here in Canada, which is a major advocate and resource for Indigenous filmmakers and media makers. And they released a report on screen pathways and protocols that is one of the places where they talk about narrative sovereignty and indigenous right to narrative sovereignty and that that's the intent of the office. It is capturing something that has been happening obviously for decades and been theorized in a lot of different ways, a lot of different terms used to talk about what narrative sovereignty means. Yeah. And it means that indigenous people need to have the right and the ability and means to shape a production based on a worldview, philosophy, way of doing things that is meaningful to them and where they are culturally located and that the production sh needs to be more value directed rather than cost directed. So where Western productions um, are extremely hierarchical and very regimented in how they go about a production. A different approach, Indigenous people don't approach production that way always and have actually been pushing back against that way of production because the hierarchy of a traditional production will not be the political order of a community that may be a film is being made about. And the film production, it has to reflect the values and of the people that the or community it's working with and the indigenous people who are on the crew so you're talking about two things because one is money right i think one is you're saying well money is not the priority the priority is the story is well that i mean money's always important <laughs> i mean at the end we got we got to say it's like because yeah. if i i'm kind of like following kim tall bear and others yeah. who have kind of positioned ourselves as like yeah. materialist about production in that you put your money where your mouth is so there's no lip service to centering indigenous perspectives and ways of doing things behind the camera it's actually happening and so there are, for instance, Sterling Harjo yeah. in talking about the production of Reservation Dogs and as well cast and crew who I just saw on a panel in Oklahoma talk about how night and day different that production experience was for them versus working on a mainstream production. And it had to do with the people and the values that were shaping the culture behind the camera. Right. So indigenous production cultures mm -hmm. are going to be different 
and it ultimately that is going to shape what ends up on screen yeah, right great. like it's it's yeah, the yeah. means of representation the means of production so narrative sovereignty is meant to capture what happens in the development concept concept phase and the organization of the cast and crew and their dynamics and who is on set Mm -hmm. as well as what ends up on screen so it's not purely aesthetics right like we're not asking we're not looking to distill what is indigenous on screen we are talking about doing something profoundly different Mm -hmm. that is much more meaningful and reflects indigenous values however the process of getting there the process of getting there Mm -hmm. it is not the deliverable that matters here it is the process have you set up the process so that those who need to be a part of the conversation are a part of the conversation they consent to the conversation they consent to participate they are meaningfully engaged in, say, the development of a project that that relationship is initiated and then taken care of through the project, whatever that looks like. This process is critical here, especially with that stereotyping coverage of Indigenous people in the news media. There was a huge incentive for Indigenous people to represent themselves, yeah. to confront the problem that was behind the camera and what was ending up in, on screen. And this became a major rallying call from the 1990s onward that it mattered, it, it mattered both who was behind the camera and then as well as who was in front of it and how they were represented. Yeah. And this has been a major orientation and driver for Indigenous media in Canada since... I remember I saw an interview with the the cast of Reservation Dogs and one of the young actors, I think she's 15, and she's talking about how she was given the power to like make up her own lines. She was given the script, but they were like, you can do whatever you want. (laughs) You say whatever you want. And she was like, I would end up doing that all the time. Like I would just tell my story in the way that I would tell my story. It was just an amazing thing to hear. When do you hear a 15-year-old, you know, young woman being able to say, I get to tell my story in the way that I want to tell my story it's pretty incredible yeah that they could be that indigenous performers can be empowered on a set Mm -hmm. rather than profoundly alienated or devalued is remarkable Sterling Harjo also has spoken about things like there is often a necessity for a ceremony on set Mm -hmm. depending on the subject matter so that is also a part where there is time and space given to that these kinds of really important practices that are innately tied to the production itself. But a Western model of film production, say, I think that would be highly alien to Western production to think we have to stop for a ceremony. I think that would be just head spinning. So we've sort of talked about this a little bit. What happened with Rutherford Falls, for example, is that the show got canceled. What happened with Reservation Dogs is the show's ended. So what I really wanted to ask you about is why is it so important that we have these this space for, first of all, non-Indigenous audiences to participate and watch these shows? I guess that's that's my question. Why is it so important for non-Indigenous people to watch these shows? Well, and I I think at one level, it's kind of what you've pointed to throughout, which is that they are going to be confronted with representations like Indigenous characters, stories, scenarios, uh, communities, like spaces, like homes, communities that they've never seen before, that they have no ability to imagine beyond what has already been embedded in their imagination. And that's often disorienting. The tactic of using humor is a way of mediating this discomfort with encountering the unfamiliar. And so I think Indigenous people, I mean, are really funny. I mean, that is a bottom line. I think many people will say this. Native humor is some of the funniest deadpan, dry humor and that comes out of these productions. I think there's a confrontation with preconceived ideas of how Indigenous people live or what Indigenous reservation looks like, but also how Indigenous people engage with settler colonial culture. Like there's so much pop culture imagery that comes through, say, Reservation Dogs. One of the characters, like Willie Jack is this amazing, I love her character. 
but she's clearly a reference to Billy Jack, a 1970s movie that we came up with, right? Like that our generation, so that would, I'm, again, aging myself, I'm of Sterling Archo's <laughs> age, his generation. And so it's like recognizing, or Aloria, is that her name? Yes, that's a character from Willow, the movie Willow from the 80s, yeah. which again, like that is a movie Old I grew up with. And it's yeah. so there's ways that it shows a kind of engagement and knowledge and actually deep expertise mm-hmm. with of navigating settler colonial culture, incorporating it and repurposing it to mean something different that. and make it show that it's a part of indigenous people's lives, lived reality. But indigenous people are constantly working that over and reframing pop culture, mainstream culture to make it meaningful for Indigenous people. I'm hoping that non-Indigenous people are seeing this and not only registering it as being funny, but registering as just how sharp and smart it is. And I'm hoping it's priming them to be more receptive and thoughtful about looking at things from Indigenous perspectives. If you watch it, I don't see how, how you can't respond differently. Who would have thought Ed Helms yeah. would be a fig like the fact that I have to think about him now as a as a ally, <laughs> just an ally, and I do. I really respect the hell out of him. Like that, you know that that's a head turner for me as well. But I, yeah, I'm like, wow. Now Indigenous media history whole has a place for like Ed Helms, and as a major, as a, as a kind of little, you know, pin in the map. We're like, thanks, yeah. man. So I'm hope and the f- I think the fact that what people are seeing is that indigenous people are operating at the level high production value prestige level and are not just doing it but killing it like knocking it out of the park and getting awards that I think is astonishing for people but indigenous artists you know people like me have known this forever it's like you just had to give us a chance. You just had to give them the chance. Mm-hmm. Gamble and you can win. Like, you know, as far as producers go, I'm like, if you make the gamble, look at what can come out of that. As sad as I am that they had such brief yeah. lives, two seasons for Rutherford Falls and three for Reservation Dogs, looking at the big picture of the strides that Indigenous people are making to reach into mainstream media industries and access those resources. I really see these as they were, in a way, tests and then proof that Indigenous people can do this. uh, And they are a gamble you can make. They're a proven quantity. And there's no reason to close the door on them anymore. We've talked about the three decades of Indigenous media growing in popularity and in production, we still have a ways to go. What are your hopes for the future of of Indigenous media in Canada? What Indigenous creatives have always needed was stable, committed funding, resources, something over time that won't leave them having to do what they always do, which is enter into a one or two year grant cycles of just looking for money. And I think every, most people here are kind of, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. That just like <laughs> writing those, just writing those applications, 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 and also having to enter co-production agreements with non-Indigenous production companies that often exploit their expertise and their labor and poison the production, offending, insulting, degrading the Indigenous participants in that production. And I've heard for over 20 years from Indigenous filmmakers and artists who are saying who were traumatized by being brought on as an advisor to a production, an Indigenous production by a non-Indigenous crew and they were just so sidelined and their input was just thrown out the window. They were there to, you know, tick a box. Yes. So what I really would love is like, is what they are calling for, which is more of a stable sources for productions that would allow them to continue to develop their experience and their skills and their ability and tell more stories involving 
many more indigenous people who were dying for the opportunity mm -hmm. to participate and learn and develop their skills on set and are not being given the chance to do so. So I would love to see something stabilized, thinking more in terms of like decades. Yeah. It's like we are looking to encourage and build the next generation of filmmakers. So what do we need to do that? We need to put our money where our mouth is. Thank you so much for all your time today. Thank Been you for wonderful. having me. So I, that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you to Hilary Atlio, who is the owner of Iron Dog Books. And <laughs> thank you to SFU Faculty of Communication, Arts and Technology. Thank you to oh, Hannah, <laughs> Hannah McGregor and Stacey Copeland, the Amplify Podcast Network. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. And, and tech athletes. We really wanted to invite the audience to participate. Oh, the questions are already starting. Tanchi, it's so nice to meet, like to listen, and it's just been such a beautiful experience. For me in the field that I work in, pretendianism is a big issue, and it's everywhere. Like, say Michelle Latimer, for example, too, that was actually very triggering. Um, so I'm curious about in the field that you work in, how was your industry combating against pretendianism? I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm like in like the film industry. I'm much, I'm an academic, but this cuts across, right? So I think Kim Tallbear once said she estimated 25 to 30% of academics who claim to be indigenous are pretendians. I will say that's accurate. It is a constant, constant thing. And it is a time eater and an energy eater and an emotion eater. I am so appreciative of the people who have come forward to identify or help. There's a network, a good, like a, not a conspiratorial network. I mean, like we have like strong personal and professional networks that we have a way to talk about that. It is absolutely a situation we are constantly grappling with and trying to work together to figure out ways to address, you know, without you know, in a way that won't burn us down or anybody else. And I know just from having friendships and relationships with people, Indigenous artists and filmmakers, it, they are encountering the same numbers as we are, if not more. And it is 100% right at the front of the conversation right now. Like, how do we deal with this? We're figuring out how to address people who may be doing this and still coming up with the language to do so because there's a whole legal dimension here we have to be careful about. Uh, Tanshi Carmen, um, thanks so much for being here and for sharing your thoughts. Um, it's really lovely to get to, to hear from you. you. You mentioned a little bit about reconciliation in your conversation and um, one film that I was thinking about is Bones of Crows and I'm wondering if you can speak a bit to how you see a film like Bones of Crows coming out and really affecting this era of reconciliation in Canada. I will own that I have not seen it yet. So I'm not really familiar. Can you talk a little bit more about Bones of Crows? I'm curious about to know more about it. Sure. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a film that spans, I think, three generations total. And it's really um, going through uh, one particular family's experience with residential schools. So um, I don't know exactly the time period when it begins. I want to say like 19, like 30s or 40s, and it goes um, right up until more or less present day uh, when it came out, I think, last spring. Um, yeah, and I don't have I don't have a whole lot of names in my head about it. It was <laughs> like genre wise, is it kind of um, like drama, horror? Um, I you know I think about a lot of reconciliation era films, um, and this is what you were saying was triggering um, my thinking about like Jeff Barnaby's work um, and how he uses the horror genre now to talk about the experience of uh, residential schools and that kind of thing. I feel like there there's a reason why these um, kinds of genres and films are coming up now as a way of critiquing reconciliation era politics. Mm -hmm. The reconciliation era was like initiated 
to construct a false endpoint to indigenous trauma and the the state's role and responsibility for that. The colonial agenda is about dispossession and erasure of indigenous people and residential schools is just one small part of that. So the way that the Canadian state framed reconciliation in terms of constructing that endpoint and mm. foregrounding residential schools as the problem mm. is <laughs> some mm. of the like most like the mm. that level of fan dancing on the part of the state <laughs> is just remarkable. So I think these movies that are coming out that are like zombie movies mm. um, that are um, using horror of like, no, no, the uh, it's unsettled. They're coming out of the earth. Like it's, it's the earth you stand on mm -hmm. and they're coming out of it. It's a way of critiquing reconciliation politics and the way it's been undertaken. And it will use that kind of like guise of the residential school to say it is not over because you think it, you say it's over. It's under your feet, like because you're here at all. Like it's the the reason you're here is all of us are here is because of colonization, right? Like it is under our feet. So it sounds a little bit like Bones of Crows is saying, well, one, there's a longer, a long intergenerational history here that has brought us where we are but that it has not ended to me what carmen for your amazing uh, talk tonight i was thinking about sterling harjo and the kind of wide range of non-actors that sterling harjo uses in his productions in miko or um, all of the young people who did not necessarily come from an acting background um, and I wonder about their futures in that film industry that um, one of the things I'm concerned about is that a white audience still has a narrow idea. So we want more, we, we want more reservation dogs. We want more of that humor and then forget about all the, or don't want that the kind of stories that are much fuller, richer, uh, use the community in ways like Miko used unhoused Oklahoma indigenous community in, in beautiful important ways and I'm, I'm wondering if if there's a if you have a concern about how young actors or actors who are just getting popular like in Reservation Dogs may be f exploited in the future by a very white centric still very white centric movie community i think that is very real and i think that the way that my my sense from going to several panels at imaginative and then at a digipop which is held in oklahoma city this year was that there was a tremendous amount of mentorship going on on those sets and like in digipop had panels where industry experts would come in and talk about what does it mean to get a talent agent What's a manager? What's their jobs? Not just giving them like interface time with professionals, but to gain an understanding of the system and how it works. And so my sense is what's happening is that they are getting mentorship from people who've had to do a lot of the hard work of having to having been exploited or attempted to be exploited by these industries, which are just by their nature. They're some of the most horrendously exploitative and that they're getting some backup, like some support and benefiting from the experience of the generation that was before them to help guide them. So I think that there's really something happening on these sets, on these productions that is doing a major service to help address the inherent exploitation of these industries. And I'm hoping that these are kinds of relationships that will follow, if not familial and community, but like formed in the process of the production that they can draw upon to help them navigate these mainstream industries. I I think, oh. so just so everybody knows, Alanisa Bomsawin has made s over 70 documentaries, which is like unheard of in any industry, anywhere ever, except for maybe Bollywood, you know, like in terms of just <laughs> volume, like, um, 
You know, I honestly, I have to keep going back to Kana Satagi. And I think because this was, she, she made, um, she had hundreds of hours of film, hundreds. And so she ended up cutting it down to, uh, Kana Satagi was one documentary, but there was really, it's a set of four. Um, they're called the Oka films and they each have a different sort of thematic or kind of lens onto the crisis either when it's happening or afterwards in terms of its impact on the community afterward, which was like obviously tremendous. Um, But I go to Kanasatagi because, you know, she grabbed her film crew and we're like, they're going to close those roads. We have to get in there right now and did it, pulled it off, got behind, got in it, stayed in it for the whole time um and participated in it was not like a disinterested sort of like objective viewer but was like straight like a part of that protest as well um there's something just flash in the pan unique about the circumstances that came together to make that happen about her drive and determination level of access you know there's all these things converged in the right moment to make this remarkable thing happen um, and so that's kind of where my mind always goes to. It's just like, it is a mind blowing kind of documentary that should be, you know, on par with anything by any documentary filmmaker in the world. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> 